Part 9, Chapter 28, Difficult Times. Nice job, everyone, over the past few days at C1 and C2. Now it's time to go down, John Paul told the team over their final dinner at Camp 2 on this rotation. We'll stay down for a few days and come back up to get our ticket punched to the top. He had told them that back in Kathmandu, they must spend the night at Camp 3 at nearly 23,000 feet on the Lhotse face in style. Otherwise, he wouldn't let them make a summit attempt. Buddy looked at one another for a long time. Dawa took over. Okay, we'll, be, we'll walk at 4 a.m., so be ready. We need to go fast, but don't be careless. Clip in always and listen to the climbing Sherpas. It'll be busy with many teams. With this good weather, everyone is up on rotation, setting up the high camps and the summit ropes. Hey, they're going to be up any day now. Tony took note of this and looked up for the first time during the dinner. That night at almost 22,000 feet was better for almost everyone compared to their first night at C1 a few days earlier. Their bodies had adapted well, and the rest back at 17,500 feet back at base camp, that'll help even more. Wait, Nima said. What? Harper replied. Let me check your harness. You must be double backed. We'll do a lot of rappelling today. Her headlamp focused on her harness buckle. He pulled loose in, confirming it was double backed. He checked her gear every time they left camp. Checking gear was a standard procedure for climbing partners. Harper checked his, much to his amusement. The team crossed the shallow crevasses on, into the lower coombe and then down climbed the ladders into the icefall. The air was crisp. It felt good against her cheeks. But then the wind picked up. Harper pulled her buff across her face. At the first break, Harper ate a handful of Swedish fish. John Paul had given her some at C C2, claiming that was his secret to climbing. Mingma just wrinkled his nose seeing him, seeing her eat them. Distracted, they both turned their heads to see who was coughing so hard. Hmm. It was one of the buddies, Bart. As the first rays of the morning sun touched the lower ice fall, base camp came into view. It felt close, but they knew it would take another hour at least. Careful to clip into the fixed line, the double ropes on every ladder, they moved steadily lower. Amazing how better I'm breathing as we go lower, Dutch told Jim. Hell, there's more O's down there. Tell me. Tell me again, why do we do this? Dutch just stammered. Uh, because we're here or something like that, or is there? <laughs> they both laughed that they reached the first tent of the expansive base camp area. I'm worried about Bart, Aaron told John Paul. He's been coughing since Gokio on the trek. He keeps saying it's getting better, but his voice just trailed off. Yeah, I've noticed it too. Trying to get into the docks at Everest Hospital. You know he has to summit. You know that, right? Aaron looked John Paul directly in his eye, standing only two feet away. Let's get him healthy, John Paul said, walking away. Bart crawled in his tent, putting his climbing boots outside. It felt good to be back in his own tent around his stuff. He, he slipped off his climbing pants and crawled into his soft, warm, sleepy bag, but he coughed hard. His chest hurt. He knew something wasn't right. You okay? Aaron asked, poking his head inside his yellow shelter. Not really. For the first time, he admitted to his best friend that something was wrong. As he lay in his sleeping bag, it was now 9.20 in the morning. He had returned to base camp from Camp 1 at 7. He still had a long day ahead. Already, he felt exhausted. The down climb had taken a lot out of him. All he wanted to do was sleep. But as hard as he tried, he just simply could not fall asleep. His head was pounding. His nose was running. Every turn brought on another wave of coffee. He tried to stifle Eve cough, not wanting to annoy his teammates in the next tens. But time moved at glacial speed. It was now 11.07. He tapped his digital watch as if that would make the time go faster. The camp was humming with activity. He heard every step. He felt a yak train lumber by in the path next to his camp. The stoves began to hiss as the, co as the cook started lunch. He rolled over and pulled his down bag up against his neck. He felt claustrophobic and fought the zipper to let him breathe. Now he was cold and he pulled the zipper close to his neck. Another crocodile roll, another coughing attack. He sat straight up. He fought to unzip the sleeping bag, but his arms were in a sarcophagus. Damn it, I'm not a mummy. Where's that zipper? He said out loud. Then he realized Aaron close by must think he's crazy with all this talking to himself. Switching between hot and cold, comfort and misery, his frustration increased as his body temperature rose. He closed his eyes and finally began to drift off. Twitching back awake, he was a sight. Drool was dripping from his mouth, snot out his nose. His heart was pounding and his head was about to explode. He was hot again. He found that tiny tab and pulled hard. The zipper moved an inch before getting caught in the sleeping bag fabric. 
With another round of zipper fights, he finally broke free by sticking his arm straight above his head. With the bag around his neck, his arm straight above his head, his face with red as it could be, all he needed was a tiny car and huge shoes to complete this circus act. But he took a deep breath to regroup, tapping his watch again. Now it was 1123. He stared at the tent ceiling, debating whether to unzip all the vents or seal them shut. Both bad ideas. His eyes closed against his will, but his brain denied sleep. Let's go! It was John Paul outside of his tent. He had consulted with the docs, and they wanted to see him ASAP. Aaron came over. As they walked to the hospital in the middle of base camp, high on a small hill, Bart looked over at Aaron. Did you tell him? He'd asked, he asked quietly, hoping John Paul a few steps ahead wouldn't hear. Yeah, but he didn't say anything. You know what this means to me. I've got to get to the summit, no matter what, Bart confided in his friend. Let's get you healthy first. Chapter 29, Base Life, Camp, and the Summit Schedule. Well, you have a good old-fashioned upper, respir upper respiratory infection, or URI, Bart. You know, the kumbu cough, the doc told him as he looked at Aaron and John Paul. Let's start you on a five-day Z-Pack course. No climbing, lots of rest, lots of fluids. Bart looked at his buddy, Aaron. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is to do nothing. The buddies walked back to camp in silence. With all the personal Sherpas and the climbers back at base camp, it was bustling with energy again. For the next few days, life would be pretty routine, up at seven for breakfast at eight, then perhaps a walk to camp one on Pomori or to Gorik Shep for acclimatization. It wasn't good to lie around inactive, even though the nickname rest days, there was a little activity each day, plus it puts more red cells in the blood bank. Some days members would wash their clothes, they'd read, use the Wi-Fi until lunchtime around noon. So the afternoons ended up being lazy. Most people just napped while others visited different teams. The climbing community is quite small, so Jim and Michael went for a walkabout to see old friends. Walking into the South African camp, it was quiet. Jim approached the tent. What the hell? Is everyone asleep? Jim shouted at the tent. How's it? Came an invisible reply from an old friendship he, that was renewed. They sat in the dining tent for talking and laughing for about three hours. They played a lot of poker. Michael lost. <laughs> well, every time they got back to every time we got to camp, every day at four we get popcorn, and I'm not going to miss it on account of you guys. Michael said. <laughs> they left after a long hug, promising that all to be safe on the hill. Almost all the team came for popcorn, except for Tony. He never came, and Bart, who was finally asleep. Pablo took inventory of the room: the long table, several canisters with hot and cold water, two big bowls of popcorn and the chairs had been neatly placed with spares along the side of the tent. A movie screen was at the end of the tent. It was comfortable in there. It was a comfortable base camp. When will we summit? I mean, what day do you think it'll happen? Pablo asked the group. Everyone was very optimistic. The weather was excellent. The rope team was at the South Coal and should have the ropes to the summit by May 5th. Dutch was beside himself talking about the potential of summit days. He looked at her. Harper had a long conversation with him on the trek. So, our queen, what do you say? Dutch put out there in his usual endearing way in a slightly annoying manner. Harper just glanced at him and smiled. She had researched this and she knew the facts. Well, the spring season accounts for 96% of all summits on Everest, while summer and winter are less than 1%. But the real action takes place on both sides during the third week of May every year. Specifically, 80% of all the Everest summits occur between May 15th and May 27th. And looking even finer, May 21st is the day when climbing from Tibet as May 19th is the summit day on the Nepal side. Claudia smiled in admiration. Okay, so May 19th it is. Aaron dropped his head deep in concentration. The Dutch then took the center stage. Well, today's May 2nd, so that's 17 days from now. We have to get back up to C2, then overnight at C3 and back here, Michael leaned in. I think we need four days for the C3 rotation and at least six days for the summit push and return. That's 10 days in the mountain, meaning we have seven days for rest and weather delays. Wow, that's pretty tight. About this time, John Paul walked into the tent. He grabbed a clean coffee mug and filled it with cold water along with a healthy spoonful of tang. Dutch continued, if we leave for C3 on Monday, May 4th, and get back here on the 8th, that gives us a week to rest up before the summit push. I think that'll work. 
But we need to leave for the summit no later than May 13th if we want to summit on the 19th. John Paul appreciated the engagement of the team but wanted to regain control. He has seen teams create aggressive schedules and not make them, throwing everyone into disarray, disappointment. There was too much speculation. Nice plan, everyone, but as we talked about before, I prefer to be one of the last teams to go to the summit, to let those aggressive ones, let them kick steps in, and then we'll find out the hot spots. Also, we can have our climbing Sherpas time to get the O's to the coal. They need time to rest as well. So if we can summon on 19th, that's great. If it's a week later, that's fine with me. We're all here throughout the end of May. Hopefully the ropes will get to the summit soon and I'll give everyone a chance to spread out so we won't have those damn cues like last year. Aaron liked that plan better. More time for Bart to recover and get a C3 rotation in. He'd already decided he was not going to go with the rest of the team if Bart wasn't ready. The conversation continued over dinner. Tony finally joined him. At the end of the meal, Tony finally spoke up. I like the 26th. He had been listening outside the entire time. Chapter 30, a tour of base camp. The buddies sat together quietly in Bart's tent. He was on day three of the ZPAC protocol for his URI. I'm not coughing as much. I feel 100% better, Bart said to his friend. I'll be ready to go when the team is. Aaron looked at him. Let's take this slowly. The doc said five days of rest and med, so not a day sooner. The heavy snow overnight was a blessing for Bart. It kept the team at base camp another day, giving him a chance to recover. The couple, Jim and Michael, spent most of the day playing cards in the dining tent while Harper read a new novel on her Kindle. It was a trashy love story about mountain climbers. It was entitled After the Summit, Everest Tales and Romance. It passed the time. Heads up, everyone. The weather forecast calls for clearing later today, so we'll head up to C2 tomorrow and take a rest day. Then we'll head to C3 on the 7th, John Paul told the team. This is game time, so get your heads into it. 